You can be seated. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. This morning we're going to talk about what it is that Jesus invites us into after the resurrection. So last Sunday is really the height of the Christian calendar in Easter. We get to celebrate the reality that after Jesus' death and resurrection, he is back to life, right? And he's going around and he's telling people and appearing to them and talking to them about what the next steps are now that he's come back to life and eventually he's going to be ascending to heaven to be with the Father. I have a couple questions with you, though, as we get started. And these questions have to do with how it is that you find yourself in a church this morning. That my guess is that many of us are here because of the influence of another person. My guess is, for those of us that follow Jesus, it wasn't because an angel appeared to us. You raise your hand if you had an angel appear to you at some point. It wasn't because someone near you was blind. I, I hope this happened, but that maybe someone was blind and Jesus came and miraculously healed them and they were able to see and you followed him. It wasn't because there was a whole bunch of words written up in the clouds that said, hey, just wanted to let you know that I'm Jesus. Come follow me. I'm the Son of God. That there, there wasn't anything flashy or miraculous that likely led you to consider faith to consider joining a church or following Jesus, my guess is for 99.9% .9 of us, it was another human being who we were in relationship with that we either saw in their life something about Jesus that made us curious, or because they told us about Jesus, or because they invited us to join them for worship, or they invited us to some sort of event, but it was another human being, whether it was a parent or a friend or someone we became acquainted with, it was their influence that drew us along in our faith journey. And that is what this passage we're going to read about this morning is, is if that is how it is truly that we are drawn into faith in Jesus, how is it that God invites us to be the types of people that are having that influence on others to bring them into faith in Christ as well? So just to tell you a little bit about my faith story, is my story is one where someone invited me to learn more about Jesus, and that captivated me and drew me into faith. So I, I grew up as a part of a Roman Catholic church, not far from here, as many of you know, in Mount Sterling, tiny little town. I went to Catholic school, and I had a great experience in Catholic school. I learned a lot of great Bible stories. I learned a lot about God. But I would say that growing up, I didn't have a personal relationship with God. I would, have not, I would not have said that I was actively trying to follow Jesus. So I went away to college. I went to Illinois in Champaign. And my freshman year on my dorm floor, there was these guys who were also in college, obviously, knocking on dorm doors because they were going to start a Bible study on my dorm floor. And they were just going door to door, asking, no pressure, would you be interested in doing this? Now I thought to myself... I've never really been part of a Bible study, but I bet my parents would be really happy if they found out my freshman year of college I was in a Bible study. And so I thought, well, what's the harm? I don't have anything that night that they're all meeting, so I'm going to go join this Bible study and figure out what in the world they're talking about. Now, as I already shared, I knew some about the Bible. I knew a lot of the big Bible stories that I had learned grow growing up. But what immediately became clear in this context to guys is they would pick up the Bible, and they would read a passage from the Bible, and then they would talk about what they thought it meant. But the next step captivated me, which was, they would talk about what the Bible meant, and then they would talk about what they were going to do that week or that month to try to apply the pieces of what they just read to their life that they weren't already applying. And week after week I went because this was curious to me. Up until that point, the Bible felt like this intellectual thing that kind of explained the things I ought to do and the things I ought not to do, and God would love me if I did the right things, and God wouldn't love me if I did the bad things. But this idea that the Word of God was integrated into your life and it was this relationship with God that was being worked out in practice was new to me. But it also was captivating and something that intrigued me. 
And so over time, I decided after multiple weeks and months of being a part of this Bible study and guys that were a part of it, pulling me aside and taking me to coffee and taking me to lunch and talking about what this stuff meant, one of them just eventually said, so what do you think about this? Do you have an interest, do you have a desire to follow Jesus with your life, to live this life alongside of him? And I did, and I made that commitment, and it's formed the rest of my life up to this point. I tell you that story because my guess is you have a similar experience, maybe not the exact same facts, but maybe it was a parent, maybe it was someone in Sunday school when you were a kid, maybe it was a neighbor, maybe it was a friend, but you saw something in their life or they shared something with you that invited you to consider faith in Jesus. It's the natural way that the gospel moves out. And I think it's natural for us when we're excited about something and we believe that it's integrated into our life and it's changed us to want to tell other people about it. Right? And we can get passionate about doing that. If you get the new iPhone 75 or whatever they're up to now and, and you find new features that's making your life more efficient or really cool apps that for whatever reason you're really drawn to, what do you want to do with that information? You want to find someone to tell about it. And it's the truth. It's the same with the gospel. So let me give you a little context when we're going to read this passage we're going to talk about today. The context is, is this, that Jesus came to earth, God himself put on flesh, and came to earth to dwell amongst us as Jesus. And Jesus is going around the earth, and he's teaching everyone about who he is. He's telling the story that there is one true God, that one true God loves every human being that was ever created and created all of us to live in a perfect world that God created. But you and I, humanity, didn't really want to live in God's perfect world. We wanted to create our own perfect world after our own image. We wanted to be the boss. We didn't necessarily like the ways that God set up the world, and so we were going to pursue our own path. And that has led to all sorts of brokenness in the world. And the story that Jesus was telling was that God didn't give up on the world, but God put on flesh and came to us in Jesus, offered himself, his life, and Jesus is going around and telling everybody what this life looks like to follow him. Jesus is killed, and for three days, he is dead. He's in the tomb, and all his followers wonder, what in the world did we mess up? We thought he was the one. Last Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection. That though Jesus was dead, he came back to life. He defeated death, he defeated sin by his resurrection. So what we're going to read this morning is the very end of Matthew, and it's, verse, or it's actually chapter 28, the very final verses, which are 16 to 20. And this is what Jesus tells those people that are left after his resurrection. So let me go ahead and read this. It should be on the screen so you can follow along if you'd like. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus is about to leave. There's 11 disciples left. There's 11 of the original 12 because Judas obviously betrayed Jesus and isn't with the group any longer. So it says 11 of the 12... They went to Galilee because Jesus told them to go Galilee, and that's where he said he was going to meet them. And just for context, Galilee is about 40 miles from Jerusalem. So it, it's no short distance. They're on foot. You know, there's no Ubers. So they're on foot. They're walking to Galilee. And you can imagine all the things that are going through their mind. At this point, they've just heard word that Jesus is resurrected. You can imagine sorting through that information Certainly, they're, they're hoping that it is true. They're hoping this is the case, but 
it's, it's hard to imagine that this could have happened as well. And so they're on this journey. They, they go to Galilee, and it says they go up on a mountain where Jesus asked them to be, and it says they see him. Now, again, it's a group of 11, and they have one of two reactions, it says. Some of them worship him, and it says that others doubted. Now, I, I don't necessarily think that we can just separate the group into those that worshiped 100% and those that doubted 100%. I think that what is clear here is this is a complex situation. This is unlike anything that's happened in the history of the world. And sometimes we read into this text and say, man, Jesus appeared to them and they doubt? Oh, I never doubt. I would have just believed. Yeah, we would not have, right? Let's be honest. It's complex. It's, it's challenging for them. And I think that what Matthew gives us a glimpse of here is that life is challenging and it's complex. And many of us would have had all sorts of emotions if we were in this exact place. And there are times when we doubt, too. And so it's an invitation, I think, for us to be real and honest about these feelings. But there are people in this context that are worshiping, and there are people that are doubting. And it says, then Jesus came to them and said, and these are the words that I really want to spend a lot of time on this morning. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The, the God the Father has given me authority. We already see that in his death and resurrection. But here's the kicker. He says, because all authority has been given to me, and this is important when you're reading the Bible when you see words like this, he says, therefore, because of that, therefore, I'm taking that authority that's been given to me, and I'm passing that now to you as my followers. And what is included in that authority? He says, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, notice what's not here. If you want to, maybe, if you're really good at speaking, if you're really confident, if you have all sorts of X, Y, Z gifts, then maybe you would be one of those people that, no, it doesn't say that. It says whether you're the doubting group, or you're the worshiping group, or the in-between group, if you're one of my followers, then your responsibility is to go. My command to you is to go. To go to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And baptism in the ancient world, in Jesus' context, is that initiation into following. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So I talked about this last time I was here. We talked about that difference between just conversion and following. So a lot of times when we talk about belief, when we talk about what it means to follow Jesus, we talk about those words, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I believe that he is my Lord. And we understand that belief is just some sort of intellectual assent. And that's a great first step, but that's not what Jesus means by following. He means to believe those things and then to orient your life, your thought patterns and your actions towards the ways and practices of Jesus. And so he's doing the same thing here. He's saying, certainly baptize people, initiate them into following Jesus, but also do the harder task in many respects of teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Teach them what it looks like to follow me. That's what people did for us. Maybe it was overt, and they sat down with us week after week, and they had a lesson, and they taught us the various strategies and the various things that Jesus taught. But maybe it was much more organic. We just got the chance to watch a parent and the decisions they made. Or we just got to watch a friend and the way that they processed the decisions they made because they were influenced by Jesus. But it comes to us through other people. And then the final thing that Jesus says here, which I think ought to be comfort to us, give us confidence and assurance, he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now I don't know about you, he's now commanded us to go and do something that feels pretty hard. And so it's comforting to me to know that he says, I'm not just telling you to do this, but I'm going to be with you. 
And we know in the the story of Scripture that the Holy Spirit is going to come to these followers in a pretty profound way as well. And the Holy Spirit, God through the Holy Spirit, through Christ, through the Trinity, is going to be there to support us in this work. And I think that's important when we think about evangelism, when we think about sharing the gospel with other people, is that all of this doesn't rest on our shoulders. We're participating in the work that God is already doing in the lives of others. It's a privilege. It's an opportunity. And yes, it might make us at times anxious to talk about God with other people, but God is there with us to do so. So I want to talk about what this looks like for us in the context of three different illustrations. And these have been helpful to me, and I hope they're helpful to you. They're actually from a book called Building a Discipling Culture. And in this book, they use these physical images to talk about what discipleship looks like in our life. But before we talk about these images, I just want to give you one other illustration about what we mean by discipleship. Because I do think that many times when we think about discipleship, we think about sharing the words and the teachings of Jesus with other people. And I want us to understand that primarily what Jesus is talking about here is practice, not information. The information is usually what starts practice, but it's not good enough. And I think that distinction is extremely important today, is that often when we think about the faith, we think about, do I know everything, or do I know lots of things about what the Bible says? Do I know that Jesus is God? Uh, Do I know that Jesus died and resurrected for my sins? That's great information to know. But what Jesus intends when he talks about discipleship is that we would orient our lives, our practices, our actions, our thoughts in the same way that that he is. So a good illustration of this that I remember impacted me uh, several years ago is I was at a Mexican restaurant at Moe's. I don't know, there's not a Moe's here, but maybe you've been to one. It's kind of like Qdoba. Uh, one of those genres of restaurants. And they were training new employees. And for whatever reason, I always imagine that maybe if someone was going through a new employee training, it was like the new employee trainings that I often had, where they stick you in a classroom and they show all sorts of PowerPoints and they they talk about the things that you have to know and, and go through the various policies that are important for you to understand. But as I was watching the new employee orientation at this Mexican restaurant, What was happening was this new employee was simply, and I mean literally, walking three feet behind the veteran employee the entire time I was there. They were shadowing them. So if she walked up to the vending machine, or not the vending machine, but the pop machine was changing the canister, the apprentice was just watching exactly what got attached. If If she was getting more potato chips for everybody in in line, then that's exactly what the person stood right behind and watched. And I thought, what a beautiful image of what Jesus meant by discipleship. That ultimately what he means by this is that we are to study and to watch the ways that he interacts with people, the things that he says, And then we're to try to learn to do those exact things in our time, in our context, in our place. So let's talk about these illustrations that I want to share with you. So Jim, you can go to the next slide. The first illustration is a circle. And this circle is intended to help us to think about how we grow in our own following of Jesus in our daily life. And I'm going to talk you through this. I know it's a lot of information on a slide. But on the average day in our life, or the average week certainly, there are things that happen to us, or there are events that happen in our week, and those create what sometimes we refer to as kairos events. These moments where, where God is doing something, or something has happened in the, the context of our world, where God wants to whisper or teach us something. Okay? And what discipleship, what following Jesus means, is instead of just moving on and and taking those as another moment in our day, we take those as an opportunity to process, if God is in this situation, how might I try to reflect on what God is up to and reorient my life in a way that seeks to follow him? So some sort of event happens, 
I usually like to think about as something that raises the emotions in us. So we think about our emotions as a barometer in our life. Maybe you feel a lot of anger. Maybe you feel a lot of anxiety. Maybe you feel a lot of frustration. Maybe there's some hate that swells up in you. But there, there's something that, that creates a disconnect. It becomes a moment for us. And the first thing, and might be the most important thing, is that we take time to observe what is happening. Because often we just fly through life, and it's just something we felt, and we're just on to the next thing. But a reflective life, I think, with God requires us to slow down and to observe what has happened. Okay, this happened, I felt this way. And then we spend some time reflecting on that. All right, I felt this way. Why is it that I might have felt this way? What's causing this deep anxiety in me? Why was I so frustrated with this situation? Why did I feel disgust or contempt or whatever emotion that came alongside of this? And then in this model, it encourages us if we have a close friend or someone else that's seeking to follow Jesus as well, to discuss this with them. And to get their opinion on why, especially if we can't sort it out ourselves, why we might have felt this way. And to ask the question that's down at the bottom, what is God saying to me in this situation? And then as we go around the circle, all right, I I felt this way, It's not the way that I should have felt, or it's not the way that I should have acted. What is something that I could do different in this situation to be more consistent with what Jesus would have taught? The count piece is, if we have another brother or sister in Christ that's helping us along this journey, can I tell them also my plan and ask them to check in with me on how I'm doing when I'm in these situations again? And then finally, we commit ourselves to acting differently in those situations. And this is set up as a pattern, how followers of Jesus ought to process the various teachings he's given us and the type of reflective life we ought to have to align our life to his. So let me just give you an example of how this has happened recently in my life. So I was a part of a meeting uh, recently, in the last couple weeks, and during that meeting there was someone in the meeting that got really angry and not just frustrated with what someone else said, but they crossed the line and treated another person in the, in the meeting with contempt and said some pretty nasty things. Now, I was in the meeting, and I felt frustrated. I felt like there was a line being crossed. And so I deflected the conversation but I didn't do anything about the bad action that had happened. So the meeting ended, went on our way. But as I was walking out of that office that day, I just felt in that observation piece that something in what I had done was not sufficient. That I had not protected, in this case it was a female, that had really, I felt, been treated unfairly and that I had kind of protected the spates, but I certainly hadn't protected her. And so as I reflected on it, I I realized that I didn't believe that I had done what is right. Now, if you're like me, I hate that feeling. (laughs) It's terrible. And my first instinct is to make it go away. Well, it's over, you know, it's too bad, you know, maybe next time I'll do better. Or to forget about it, because i got a whole list of other things I could be working on. And so I'll be completely honest, that's my first instinct. And sometimes I let that first instinct get the best of me, and that's what happens, and it just kind of goes away. But in in this case, I continued to reflect on what I could have done different. And I ultimately went to the person that I felt like had, had been mistreated, and I talked to her about it, and it clearly had hurt her. Um, And not only had it hurt her because of this other person's actions, but it hurt her that no one in the room stood up for her. And I I didn't want to say anything about anybody else, but I took that personally, that that was my responsibility, one of my responsibilities in that place. And so that's what conviction looks like, right? That's when you start to ask yourself, well, how might Jesus be calling me to a different action 
than someone that doesn't think about following Jesus. And so I started to put a plan together. I had already talked to her, and I realized that I needed to talk to that gentleman, the person that had done it, personally. Again, don't want to do that. I, I don't enjoy doing that. It, it feels terrible to do that. I told her I was going to do that, right? Because now I've created a level of commitment. Someone else knows that I'm going to take this action. It'll hold me accountable. And so I, I went and talked with him. Um, I, I, he received it okay, I would say. But it really wasn't about me convincing him it was really about me standing up for her and making sure it was clear that I felt like his behavior was not appropriate. So I give that as an example. There's a thousand of those things that happen every month in our lives. And I don't always get it right, but I am committed to that process, and I think that all of us ought to be committed to this process as well. What am I going to do about what it is that I've experienced because I'm a follower of Jesus? All right, I want to show you another illustration. This illustration, again, is about what our discipleship journey looks like. It also comes from this book, Building a Discipleship, a Discipling Culture. And so this is a half circle. And this really is intended to show the rhythms of our life and how at different points in our life, sometimes at different points in our day, we oscillate between abiding in God, getting our nourishment from God, so we see that on the left-hand side. That's rest. That's the truth that God is our source, that God loves us, that God cares for us, that God sustains us. And then the other side of that is getting out there and doing the things that God has called us to. The work of following Jesus the work of helping to connect other people to God, to help connect other people to following Jesus. And in those processes, in the abiding piece is our growth. Because the reality is you can only give to others what it is you already have. So if you are not being fueled in your relationship with God, if you are not being empowered by God's word, if you're not growing in your relationship with God in prayer, if you're not growing in your understanding of God, if you're not going through that circle and reflectively processing what God's teaching you to do, you're not going to be very effective in sharing those things with other people. Right? Your, your tank's going to be empty, and you're not really going to be able to share anything of value with others. And so both of these things are important. We worship on Sundays to, to empower us, to fuel us. We study God's word because we need to learn more about what it is that God's, what Jesus said and what Jesus taught. We need to spend time in prayer and conversation because it builds our relationship with God. And as we experience God fully in those ways, it allows us to be more fruitful in our outward ministry, in our growth. And so on one side is abiding and growing in God, and other times we're in seasons where we're fruitful, we're really investing in other people, we're pruning, we're really refining those areas of our life that are far from Jesus. All right, one more illustration I want to share with you, and this one is often called the triangle. And I give you this one because I want you to think about assessing your own life and, and how you're doing right now. So when we think about discipleship and modeled in the life of Jesus, Jesus models for us really three primary relationships. The up relationship with God, which is the one we just talked about in abiding, growing in our relationship with God. The in relationship, which is our relationship with other people that follow Jesus or the church. And then the out relationship, which is our relationships with people in our community or in our family or in our neighborhoods that don't follow Jesus and what influence we might be able to have on them. And each of these relationships are essential to what it means to be a disciple or follower of Jesus. The up relationship is, is worship. It's singing praise to God in song. It's praying to God, talking to God throughout our day about what's up and what we're feeling and how things are going. It's studying God's word and understanding what it is that he's teaching us. It's a vital relationship. It's our relationship with God. The in relationship is our relationship with other believers that holds us accountable. 
that helps us to grow. The reality is that we learn so much more about Jesus when we hear how other people are processing their relationship with him too. And we need those relationships and we need that accountability. And then the final one is that out relationship. That we can't just hang out amongst other Christians or other people that think exactly like us. Jesus' command is quite clear. Go, make disciples, let other people see what it is that you believe that you found in Jesus. If you think it's valuable, wouldn't you want to share something that you thought was valuable with other people? And not in a high-pressure pyramid sales scheme, but in a way, I, I found something that's really been meaningful in my life. It's really made an impact on who I am. Wouldn't you like to hear a little bit about this? And I, I don't know about you, but for the most part, when you use that approach, no one gets real anxious about it. I mean, people are always telling me their thoughts on everything. It doesn't feel any different, right, to share your thoughts on something. And I'm not telling, I'm, you know, we're not sharing it with people to put pressure on them, and I think this is really important because I think that at times churches have gotten evangelism wrong where you're beating people over the head or you're, you're leading with condemnation and judgment. That's not at all what Jesus' approach was. Jesus invited people to experience his love. And he, in, he invited them. He didn't force them. He invited them and said, hey, this is something I found. It's vital. It's important. I believe it's true. Join me if you'd like to. And some people responded to that invitation, and some people didn't. But unfortunately, this is not optional for us. <laughs> it's quite clear in the Great Commission that God invites us to go and to make disciples of all nations. One way that I've heard someone refer to this is the difference between a lake and a river. You know, you can get in a lake, and it's usually still water, and it's, it's not going to have any impact on you. But if you step into a river, it's going to take you somewhere. Rivers cut new pieces of new paths. They, they cut away at the land. There's movement to them. And the gospel was never intended to be a lake where you just jump in and, and live like as you always had. It was always intended to be a river. It's going to change you. It's intended to take us to places that we never thought we'd be taken. It's intended to make an impact. It's intended to, to mold the landscape around us in our families, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. And it's intended to do all that for love, intended to do all that for good, intended to do all that to be a part of what God is doing in making all things new and restoring all that is broken. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, not because it's easy. We prefer the passages where Jesus just tells us how much he loves us. We prefer the passages where we just get to receive. And yet your word mixes those pieces of affirmation, those pieces of encouragement with these commands, with these calls. Because you love us, we get the opportunity to go out and to mold and to be the people you've created us to be. Father, help give us confidence that we don't do this work alone, but that you come alongside of us. And Father, help us to participate in your mission in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, and wherever you may take us. Amen.